So when we think about international research collaborations, I believe that they're going to play a critical role in our quest to better understand social determinants of health for individuals and families. Nurses who engage in international collaborative research will be better equipped to provide high quality, culturally sensitive health care to individuals and families throughout the world. Moreover, they're likely to find the work more satisfying and more professionally, both professionally and personally. And I think the great part is you get to travel to countries like here and to meet amazing people. So the purpose of this presentation is to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities associated with engaging in international research. And personally, I think there are more um, benefits or opportunities than challenges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about challenges that we experienced and opportunities in a study that I'm going to be sharing with you in a few minutes. And that study is an international study. It's a mixed method study where we look at adaptation and resiliency in families of children with Down syndrome. And what I'm going to share with you is some of the strategies that you could use to get more involved in international research collaborations. So here's the Spanish version. <laughs> Good? Do I leave it on? No? You're okay? Okay? So in the study that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, over 3,000 parents from more than 50 countries have participated. And so we'll first talk about the challenges. One of the first things is to figure out who are you going to work with? Who are you going to collaborate with? And so the ways that you can possibly identify your collaborators is by attending national and international conferences. And for me, it's been the most amazing way to do it. Because when I share the research that I do, someone in the audience will come up and they'll say, Marcia, we can do it in our country. So that's actually how I found many of my collaborators. You can also search through the literature and find people that are doing research that you're interested in. You can search the internet, or you can ask your colleagues or your teachers, do you know anyone that's doing this kind of research? These are just some of the collaborators that I work with, and you can see they come from many different countries. But many of them were people that I met attending a conference. And again, they heard me speak, and then they got interested in my research, and then we found a way to collaborate. It's an amazing way to be able to not only get to learn more about what's going on in a different country. Um, but I was a Fulbright scholar, and how many of you have heard of the Fulbright program? Do you know the Fulbright program? But in the Fulbright program, one of the ideas is, is that if we would talk more, if we would share what we do with others, there would be less fighting, there would be less wars. And so the idea is, is we talk, but even more importantly, we listen. So one of the groups where I go to meet a lot of people and to have um, a lot of collaborations is the International Family Nursing Association. And this is a group that we actually have people from more than almost 40 countries come to our conferences. And this just shows the vision of IFNA is nurses transforming health for families worldwide. And we have, um, this just shows you our past conference, which was here in Spain. It was in Pamplona, and it was here just two years ago in 2017. But next year, you could come to Washington, D.C., and we'll have a conference there on social determinants of family health. And it's, it's a great experience. Um, not only do you have researchers there, but you have people teaching about family, and you have clinicians who are working with families. And usually there's about 400 people at the conference. So if you're interested in more information about the conference, I can share information with you and you can pass it on to them. But it's an amazing conference. The other thing is to figure out how and when you work with people. Because the people I work with, they come from 11 time zones. And so just to figure out who you work, when you work with them, is a challenge sometimes. And sometimes the best time we figured out is we meet either at 11 in the morning or 9 in the morning because we have people all the way over in Japan, but then we have people who are on the other side. So, but the way we communicate is by email, but we also use Skype or what we use a lot is Zoom. And then you can do video conferencing, but you can also communicate by Facebook. We've communicated in many different ways but I think what's exciting is the fact that you can work with people all over the world, 
but you can communicate with them very, very quickly about what you're interested in doing. Some of the and other things is like we said, as far as strategies, we do do ongoing communication by email and that's probably what we do the most. We do have group meetings. And then I did spend time in some of these countries as a visiting professor. So when I was there, we were able to get the grant started or get the work started and then just come back to be able to make sure it was going. Um, the one of the big challenges though is translating the measures because many times the measures you're interested in might be in English, they might be in Portuguese, they might be in some other language. And the key is to make sure that you do that translation, the back translation, but also you have to make sure that the measure that you use is culturally sensitive. Because what uh, we use in the United States might not work here in Spain. And so I've been very fortunate that the collaborators are the ones that work with me to be able to translate the measures, but even more importantly, to say, does it make sense in their country? Because if the measures you're using don't make sense in the country where you're collecting the data, your data won't be as valuable as you're hoping. So we've translated our measures into eight different languages. And I will tell you that Dutch and Hebrew were probably the hardest for me because at least with Spanish and Italian, I can recognize some of the words. With Hebrew, I can recognize nothing. And we also use SurveyMonkey to collect the data. So once we translate and then we back translate, we put them on SurveyMonkey. But when I tried to put the Hebrew questionnaires on SurveyMonkey, because they start at the other end of the line, it didn't come out right. And so I finally got back to my collaborator and I said, you're gonna have to do it from Israel because it doesn't work. But now it's working, so we have it. And this just shows you the examples of a sentence in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and then Japanese. Japanese is also one that, there, those words don't come easy to me. <laughs> I can't say any of them. As far as access to and recruitment of participants, this is where it's critical that you work with people in the countries, people who know, understand the country, people who can help you to figure out how do you reach that group that you're interested in. And so what I've found is family researchers that I work with that understand, but they also, you know when you do your research, there is a gatekeeper or the people that are helping you figure out how to reach the families or the patients that you want to talk to. And I think the critical part there is you have to help them understand what's important about your research. If they don't think it's important, they're not going to be very good in helping you reach the pa your um, participants. The other thing is to follow up. This down here is a picture of families from Portugal that I met with the families, I talked to the families about the research I was doing, and then they talked to other families about participating in the study. In Italy, I remember I went there and I gave a talk about my research, and when we got done, a father raised his hand and he said, I will be in your research because I've read your work. Now, I'm somebody who's published quite a bit, but I would much rather give a talk than write a paper and so, but actually hearing from that father made me understand why it's so important that you publish your work. Because you can give a talk and the people walk out and they don't remember what you said. But if you publish your work, it's there forever for people to go back and look at. As far as that, what we typically do is put an invitation to participate on websites for the groups that we go through. Um, and I will tell you, for the, when we collected data from the families in Spain, we contacted local support groups for families of children with Down syndrome, but they said, no, no, it's very important you go through Down España. And Down España is a very large, more umbrella organization that helps families of children with Down syndrome. It took me about a year to get through the process to be able to have those people approve my work. So, but when they did, on the very first day they put it out on Facebook, 200 people started the questionnaire. So I think it's really important to listen to the people in the country to understand where you need to go to be able to connect with people. The other thing is to put the time in. Instead of just flying into an area and saying, I'm going to do research here, 
you have to spend time with the people in the area to help them to understand that not only will you collect your research there, your data there, but you're going to come back and share your findings. And this just shows you when I was in Ireland. I was there as a Fulbright scholar, and I would go do interviews, and I interviewed people all over Ireland, but I went by train, I went by bus, I went by however I could get with meet the families. But it also gave me a great chance to learn about Ireland. Um, in Brazil, we had one of my collaborators. She initially thought she could just put the sent out an invitation to the participants, but she only heard from very, very few people. So then what she did with her students is they went to communities and started talking to people and who people who told them another family who had a child with Down syndrome. Eventually, she collected data from 100 parents, and then they went on to do interviews with a subset of 40 parents. Sometimes just the procedural issues are hard. Um, to go through human subjects or your ethics committee, what we have to do is, though, so we go through, what are they called here? Ethics committee, IRB, what do you call them? Institutional review board, no? If you do a research project, where do you have to go to get it approved to go through to start? Do you have an ethics group? Uh-huh. Okay, so the ethical committee. So in what we do is our study is approved by the UNC Chapel Hill Ethical Committee, but in every country we had to figure out do we also need to go through theirs in their country. In some countries we do, in other countries we don't. But there's also issues. There are certain countries that there were rules about what questions you asked. And in Portugal, we couldn't ask about religious preference, racial, or ethnic background. Um, so in order to get approval, it's really critical that you work with somebody who knows what it's like in that country because they can help you get through the committee. Also, as far as funding, there is funding available for international research, but there's also rules about certain things. So um, like the Fogarty International, they will fund all over the world. Um, the Fulbright is from the U.S., but they will fund research in some other countries. But then if they're European Union, I couldn't apply for it, but I could work with other people to apply for it. Um, the National Institute of Health at U, um, at the, in the United States, initially we didn't have as much global research, but now there is more. As far as the data set, um, this is the statistician who does my re data, and he likes complex data. And now I think he doesn't realize how complex because when he opens up SurveyMonkey and he sees it all in different languages, I think he's regretting it, but actually he's an amazing man and he doesn't take money for it. I just have to buy him wine. And so I buy him wine from the countries that I travel in. So now I'm learning Spanish wine and I'll come back and buy him wine from Spain. His wife is a really close friend with mine and he was on faculty at our school. But the parents who, this is, we use SurveyMonkey and it works really well because people across the world also use SurveyMonkey. Um, but we also gave parents the opportunity that if they didn't want to use the online version, they can do it in paper. But I will tell you, in the majority of countries, we did it online. But there were a few countries that the people there knew that the people would respond better if we did a paper version. So we did the paper version, and then she put them in the computer on SurveyMonkey. Um, what we've done, though, as far as our data, we have all the data coming to us, so we clean up the data. We actually, not we, the statistician, and then he also does all the analysis. So he makes sure the scores are all done the exact same way. He makes sure the analysis is done the same way. And sometimes it does take a little work because even though you've carefully looked at the survey and you think everything matches exactly, then you find out one group put the one as the five and the five as the one. And so then you have to switch it. But it has worked really well for And then what we've done is the people that I work with in the different country, they will be able to publish in their language, in their country, but then we will also publish as a group. So we'll have choices to do it different ways. 
So as far as opportunities or benefits, I think one of the great things is sharing your expertise and your resources. You could work with somebody in a different area that has expertise that you don't have. It also gives you a chance to get a larger data set. So if you are interested in a subject that there isn't a lot, like if you're studying a rare condition, you might be much better off if you study with, you work with people in many countries because then you'll have a larger sample. The other thing is I think you can learn, but I think one of the biggest ones is the last one. By working with people from different backgrounds, different um, countries, you learn more about some of those assumptions that you've taken for granted, some of your beliefs, and you realize that you don't have the answers for everything. Other people might have really, really good answers. Um, I think the other thing is the greater dissemination of your findings. Um, so like I said, we presented our findings at local, at regional, national, international. But also we've been publishing in, in many different languages. We'll publish in different places. So I think it broadens where your work can go. And I think the other part is for the participants, the idea that we can come back and share with them what's going on in other countries. Um, so if you're a family that has a child with Down syndrome living here in Spain, it might be very interesting to hear for you to hear what is it like in Portugal? What is it like in Brazil? What is it like in Japan? Is it different? And the families have been very interested in hearing about it. So I want to thank the, parent, the parents who participated in the study. Obviously, the study wouldn't be the study without them. But the colleagues that I have worked with have been amazing.